thank you very much for the introduction. And also I would like to thank the organizers and the program committee of this uh, beautiful workshop for inviting me and giving me the um, possibility to present our results here. Um, I would like to start with a theme which was very prominent in this seminar room at the beginning of Zen's, like 1998, 1999. It was uh, Richard Feynman's quote, there's plenty of room at the bottom. It's a great pleasure to recite this because it was overused in the, uh, let's say, early 2000s, and I didn't like it at all anymore. And um, I would like to project it in a way that we answer the question, how far can we go down with nanolithography, nanofabrication? I mean, we have different clean rooms, and how far can we really manipulate matter? And there's an obvious question to that, given by this gentleman. It's called the happy philosopher, not the grimming <laughs> philosopher, Democrat, um, who said, okay, it's the atom um, from Atomon, uncatchable, indivisible. And so basically what I would like to show you today is that we can really go down to the atom scale with our nanofabs right now. We are the generation who can do that um, with in the clean room and also with devices which you carry around here. I also would like to quote Democrat a little bit more. Atoms are too small for human senses to be detected. Well, he didn't have the nice nano tools what we have now developed in the last 20 years. Okay, so what is this talk about? Um, I talk about heterostructures made out of 2D materials. I predominantly talk about MOS2. And then um, we use a gentle focused beam of helium ions. And by the interaction with the molybdenum disulfide, we kick out sulfur atoms. And these turns out to be um, luminescent center. Um, I forgot to tell that everything is encapsulated in hexagonal bornitride um, to optimize the optical properties of these materials as everyone is doing now since almost 10 years. And so also, just to give you a glimpse, what, is, what you're expecting here is a measurement from our laboratory. So we plot the luminescence intensity. This is the photoluminescence intensity in this plot. And so as a reference, this is the so-called 1S exciton. And um, from our yesterday's talk by Richard Warburton, we know what the exciton is. Electron hole pair excited, they bind, they have the binding energy. And so this is the normal excitation or luminescence. And then once we include one of these defects, there's this peak coming out here. And this is the so-called single photon emitter, the SPEs, as we call it. And you cannot see the titles. And hereby we call them SPEs. We are allowed to talk about single photon emitters because we measure the so-called autocorrelation function, as you have seen also by the talk by Mitya Asatür and also Richard Warburton, that the basically um, the percentage that two photons come out of the system is below 50%. It's actually in this case 23%. And hereby they're quantum emitters, what we call. And also what you also see in here, the lifetime of these emitters is also, um, well, a little bit hidden. It's about one to two microseconds because the lifetime basically tells you the next time an, another exciton comes into the defect. And that's all in there, all is measured here at low temperatures. And it's basically motivated by the talks what we have seen yesterday by Metea Atatür, by Richard Warburton. And it's about quantum technologies, about our quantum communication sensing and all these protocols. But I would like to, you to guide you all through there once my computer works. So I will give you an introduction to the field. I will describe in detail the atomistic emitters, how they are fabricated, how they work. And then at the end for the experts amongst us, I will discuss the level structure and also the exit and transitions, what we have in there and with the selection rules. And then of course the next directions. Everything started um, 2015 with these five papers. And basically, all of them look or showed similar luminescence intensity plots here, as we can see, we have again the exciton. And here now as a function of wavelengths, that's below the exciton, there are these defects. And it turns out that in this case for tungsten selenide, there are also quantum emitters. Why was the published in Nature Nanotechnology and then Optica here? Because the idea is that we um, have a very flat, a communistically flat material, which you can basically paste into any photonic circuit on optoelectronic electro-optic circuit. And by that, put in quantum property on top of these circuits. That thrilled the whole community and the 2D materials. And there are many people worked on that. In particular, then there was this paper here, 
saying that um, if you have defects in hexagonal bonitride, you, it should work even at room temperature. Perfect, the perfect material, perfect system. From the beginning, there was one idea how that should work. And this is sketched here. Basically, um, you need defects and also strain. Why defects? The idea is once you have a defect, the excitone goes in there because it has a low energy. And on the defect, you have cooler energies. Basically, the second excitone cannot enter there. And so once the first excitone recombines, you have the single photon coming out. That was the simple idea there. But you need to feed these excitones in there. And, and when you look at the energy landscape, the Hamiltonians, uh, strain helps such that the excitones drift down here. And then you can always feed once the first exciton has recombined and then you get one photon after another out of this little system. There wasn't many experimental proofs of this concept as um, shown up here on the left. So you have a layered material on a rubber PDMS and then you stamp this 2D materials on top of these silicon silicon oxide chips that you have these little um, dielectric nanopillars. And in an atomic force micrograph, you can see these uh, protrusions coming up. And these all turn out to be, first of all, luminescence centers. And then if you do the autocorrelation function of the um, luminescence, they turn out to be quantum emitters. So that was an, let's say, first um, idea how everything works. And this concept is a guiding theme for the community right now while I still speak. So there have been reports on let's say tungsten selenide in um, plasmonic tips. And you remember yesterday we had the fantastic talk by Rainer Hillenbrand with the plasmonics. You can couple these because when you bend over the 2D materials, you always have the strain and also defects coming up there such that you can have it. Here's another paper in tungsten selenide encapsulated in HBN. So this idea also works with encapsulated materials. Our work, we will, I will show um, in a second. And what I really like as well for HBN, actually, engineering wise everything is solved what you need to do is basically grind hbn to very small pieces and then you can inject or spray coat your materials on top the hbn nanoclusters they were they are quantum emitters at room temperature if you just want to have nano uh, quantum emitters at a, a certain position go this route and follow this paper here um, and also these um, quantum emitters were included into cavities here it's a bull eye cavity then, oh, I'm sorry. Then we have the um, dielectric um, nanopillars, as for example, done here by Stefan Meyer at LMU, together with co-workers, of course, in tungsten selenide. Here's one work, first of all, here with the plasmonic cavities. Um, again, you have always this idea that you have strain and uh, defects. This is one work by John Finley at the Walter Schottke Institute. And these, um, let's say, guide these waveguides, the plasmonic waveguides were then also shown for silicon nitride and tungsten selenide. Again, as you can see here, it's always the idea you have the strain and the defects. And this is the guiding theme to all that. So you know, might ask now, why am I giving this talk? Everything is shown and we should just jump on it and do the same fantastic work as Richard Warburton has done for the Gallen Mars night, um, quantum dots. I mean, it's a playground and it should work. Actually, the story is a little bit more complicated, and this is why I give this talk here. From the beginning, it was clear that there's not only one defect in HPN, like it's, let's say, sketched in here in this inset, but from the beginning it was clear there were six. To my knowledge, there are at least 20 different defects, which are luminescence in HPN, and they're all reported across the whole, um, let's say, near infrared spectrum down to the UV vis. And I give you one flavor here. If you have, a, as it's called, VN and B, so the nitrogen sits at the position of the bore, and then next to it, you have this vacancy. Um, there's a reconstruction going on. And so by that, you um, change the symmetry of this typical hexagonal, or let's say hexagonal type um, symmetry of the materials, such that you have a twofold symmetry in here. And all of a sudden, you can have spin um, activations, which is very interesting. But there are many more. And also, I would like to show one very recent paper by Metasatur in this respect. So this is um, by Hannah Stern from this year published. Um, basically, it's a room temperature setup with HBN. And then here you have the microwave strip line and a magnet. And then there's an optically detected magnetic resonance as a function of frequency. In the contrast, you can see that there are these spins coming up. 
And then nicely, the frequency scales with the magnetic field as you expect for an, a magnetic resonance in these systems. So now we're at the state that we ask, what kind of level structures do we have? What, what, of, what kind of selection rules do we deal with? What kind of wave functions are we having in there? And this is the talk I'm gonna talk today about. So um, what we are doing is, as I said, we encapsulate MOS2, another team disease, with, um, with HBN, and then we use a helium ion microscope. In central terms, this helium ion microscope um, focuses ions onto the material and kicks out sulfur. And then you can have a vacancy on the top sulfur vacancy, bottom sulfur vacancy, also molybdenum atoms can be kicked out, also atoms from the environment. Why does that work? Actually, it's not so clear, not so on first view. I wanna, where am I? Sorry for that. There are many different ways to interact with my computer. So here we go. Um, so basically we start with, let's say helium ions with 10 um, kilo electron volts up to 30 kilo electron volt. Th that energy is far too high to kick out atoms. So atoms from any, let's say polymers are typically in electron volts. And so the trick here is that these electrons interact with the substrate also with the material itself. And by, by that you have secondary electrons coming out. If you look at this, we have a 30 kilo electron volt helium ion. And then you have, let's say, electrons coming up to about 10 electron volts up here. And this nicely fits to the so-called formation energy. What is the formation energy? It means that you have a sulfur vacancy Let's say at the um, balance band maximum, it's up here, you um, generate a non-charged neutral sulfur vacancy. And if you go, let's say to the conduction band up here, you can charge it by one electron. And so you have a VS one minus charged um, state. And you have to pay Coulomb energies. It's a Coulomb ladder, what you see here, in order to get um, a charged, a triple charged, for example, vacancy in these materials. And this energy typically is between 0.5 and let's say two electron volts, depending on what, what kind of um, um, functional you take in your Apinizio calculus. I always quote this one here because it's the first paper in this respect, but now there have been uh, 20 different numbers published by Apinizio groups. If you look at the molybdenum vacancies, molybdenum is much heavier than sulfur. And we have an atom number of let's say 42 or something. And so it, it takes much more energy to kick the um, atom out of that. And you see, typically we find values in literature between five and 10 electron volts. And again, here you can have a positively but also negatively charged molybdenum vacancy in your system. So we expect formation energies for sulfur somewhere at one and for molybdenum somewhere at between eight and 10 electron volts. The second advantage of using a helium ion microscope is in this case, the beam is really tightly focused down to about 0.35 nanometers. And when we encapsulate everything with this hexagonal bonitride, we can um, calculate the distribution of the beam diameter for um, let's say a target depth. This is now the HBN thickness. Typically we take about 10 nanometers and you see the beam diameter is still one nanometer, roughly. By the interaction, it's a um, Rutherford cross-section interaction that the helium ion penetrates the HBN and then it's scattered. And still, the beam stays together. So we have a, the a right energy, we have the right focus to kick out single atoms. This is the idea. The problem is now, how can you image these vacancies? Of course, with a laser spectroscopy, it's difficult because the laser spot is, let's say, one micron. If you have a really good confocal microscope in the, let's say, bluish region, you can go down to 350 nanometers, but it's much too large. What we did here for this experiment, we collaborated with Alex weber Bacioni in Berkeley, and um, we first fabricated MOS2 layers on top of uh, graphene, on top of the substrate silicon carbide, because, and then we um, wrote lines and also um, single shot exposures of defects. And afterwards, we looked at the sample with a scanning tunneling microscope tip. So electrons tunnel through here, and we need now the graphene to have a sink for the electrons. And we measure now the transmission contrast of the STM tunnel probability that we can image the single defects. And with the STM, we have the right resolution to do so. In total, so this is an image, first of all. In total, we have seven 
different defects which we found after the helium ion bombardment. And the C here, that's the sulfur top vacancy. D is the sulfur bottom vacancy. And they can be also passivated with oxygen because we carried around these samples in air in the clean room. And so this is the top sulfur vacancy with oxygen, this is the bottom sulfur vacancy with oxygen. And so if you summarize B, C, and D as an count, um, we get a number per helium ion, which exactly matches the expectation of the cross-section of the Rutherford cross-section of sulfur. So we summarize B and C, and this amounts basically to the expectation value up here. I always make this joke here, Elmer got a PhD because he counted basically single um, little spots on these um, um, graphs here, and he spent weeks counting this. I mean, of course, we looked at it from a more software-based analysis and everything, but finally, Elmer accepted, okay, the way I do it personally, just picking it once by another one, it's the best way. Um, there are also um, other black um, vacancies, and these are black because they're charged by the interaction with graphene. What we know when we count them, and Emma did that, it's basically they're pretty much uh, consistent with the um, cross um, uh, section, what we expect for molybdenum. So, but I have to say, black always means that you cannot see anything because they're charged. But so they are consistent with molybdenum defects, but it can also be that you have defect complexes in there. And then first on, there are also uh, defects like E and F, which you can find here, which do not even have the symmetry what you expect for this um, um, hexagonal um, structures. So that looks nice on first view, but are they really um, sulfur vacancies? Actually, in order to do so, you need to use an atomic force microscope because still this is an interaction of the electrons tending from the tip, it's a gold tip and CO, um, um, basically a termination with the orbitals of the sulfur vacancy. And only when you have um, at the same time concurrently done an atomic force microscope with an atomic resolution, you know that there's a really a dip in there. And by that we know that this is basically really a sulfur vacancy on the top. In the bottom vacancy, you see that there's a tiny, tiny protrusion coming out. And this is actually what we were looking for because when there's a bottom vacancy up here, there's a reconstruction of the crystal locally that the top sulfur atom comes out a little bit. And this is also the reason why we can see it in the STM, because the top sulfur um, atom comes out and by that the orbitals interact nicely with the um, STM. As a matter of course, these measurements are consistent with the Apinicia calculations. I was surprised how many parameters are there in these Apinicia calculations to mimic that. So I have a good feeling to show you these um, plots here, but you can also find um, many other, let's say, um, nicely looking pictures. Um, so Christoph Kastel, our postdoc in the group, came up with the idea, so if it's really a sulfur vacancy, we should also show it thermodynamically. And um, he had this idea, which is um, shown here. He, he built basically a cryostat where he could heat up the samples up to about 8,000 Kelvin, and then cool down without breaking the vacuum to about 4 Kelvin, and then did the same measurement. And to our joy, let's say, or satisfaction, we saw that the same emission here at about 1.75 EV comes out. And also the excitons are there still. It's not so nice. It's an ensemble measurement. But um, basically, we could reproduce or refabricate these um, emitters with other, let's say, measures. And that was very satisfactory for us. On top, by doing this annealing series, 800 Kelvin, 700 Kelvin cooling down, 500 Kelvin cooling down, and so forth, we could have, we got out the activation energy of these um, emitters, and we know now that these activation energy is at 0.7. And that is, again, consistent that these are indeed sulfur vacancies, what we are looking at. Okay, um, a little bit on the gimmicks and the clean room. When you have these um, samples, you can either irradiate the sample before the encapsulation or after the encapsulation. After the encapsulation, oxygen, nitrogen, and water stays out. I mean, as we all know, in all these surfaces, there's water. And uh, when you want to deal with single orbitals, the water is quite a strong molecule with the electroaffinity. And so we did the same series here on the left. Again, we have these emitters at 1.75 eV, but you see there sometimes also a duplet coming up here. 
I mean, sum up across very many ones. Actually, Lucas did all these statistics on that. He used a computer program for that, don't worry. Um, when you look at the numbers, there are two distributions. We were aware there's something going on. And then when we did the same experiment with encapsulated materials, we find that there's a quite nice distribution. And um, you might wonder why well, this surely depends on the iron dose, what you use. Yes, of course, we did this experiment. So for very low um, iron dose, we found these single photon emitters very nicely. And if you increase the iron dose, then you find up to, let's say, four, three, five ones. And also here we did the statistics. For example, at the lowest um, dose, what we have, which is about 400 ions per spot, this is basically we just focus on one single spot, we find that predominantly there's no quantum emitter showing up. Fair enough. But about 18% are single quantum emitters and about 0. Point something percent, um, two, photon, uh, two emitters come up in the focus spot. And so we can here write down, we have an total activation yield of about 20%, and then the number of uh, single emitters is about 18%. You might see these dashed lines, and these are actually Poisson statistics. And what we find is when we increase now the um, iron per dose, we can nicely describe everything by Poisson statistics. Poisson statistics, you know, is from the rain droplets, which come up here. I think we have it right now in Munich. So if you have in a terrace and you start, and this is actually what we expect also for ions coming from a helium ion beam acting, interacting with your sample. There's some, let's say, um, noise because of the columns, the um, electro columns. And this is what we finally see then also here in the generation of that. At the highest dose, what we looked at, you see there's a deviation of the Poisson statistics. Mainly, spectrally, these emitters are overlapping, but also it, it is possible that you form um, defect complexes. So also that in the um, material itself, these defects start to interact. And this is the deviation what we see in here. You can do really nice for things with that. You can write TUM, for example, with a lot of defects in the, on a material which no one is looking at. But okay. Um, instead, we looked here. This is one project by Katya um, just before Corona. So we looked at the long-term stability. So this is now a matrix. This is how the chips look like. And we always now know how to fabricate them with the right dose. They always have a pitch of two or three nanometer, uh, micrometers such that one laser spot is only focusing on one defect. And so we wrote these lines here. Now we pick out an emitter A and B at the first day. And the first one is not here, A, B is there. For four days later, we cooled them down. We warmed them up. We cooled them down, warmed them up. And now, so they are blinking, and we always reference with respect to the 1s exciton up here, because also, as you can see here, sometimes the 1s exciton is shifting in energy, and because this is because you have residues on your sample or oxygen. And now all of a sudden, this electron hole pair, they feel the cooler interaction with the environment. And by that, we reference everything with respect to the exciton. You see, in the first day, it's very broad statistics of all these 100 emitters. And then after 90 days, actually, oh my God, there's a new emitter. And I can tell you when we saw that, we saw it, oh, it's not there. But it's one of these results when you do statistics, it's always good and you say, well, it appears, 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 it, it has to be there. And at the, one of the final slides of today's talks, I will explain you, this is real, this is real. And also the one what we had before when we had the uh, irradiated the samples before the encapsulation, we understand it also now. These are the ones, um, the quantum emitters interacting with oxygen. I will show you this slide and I promise it to you. Okay, um, so basically we can narrow the statistics, but there's a second ensemble coming up. So we have three ensembles. Um, how precise can we um, fabricate these um, emitters? Again, let's go back to this experiment here with the STM. And you see actually there are also lines. You might wonder how do you find 10 nanometers square on a chip with um, MOS2 layers, which are 100 micron large? There's no way to find it. So basically we patterned um, the whole 100 micron MOS2 with lines. <laughs> and so um, we overused our helium ion microscope for three days. Um, but it, it can tell you it, it nicely ran through. When you look at these lines and um, look now at the statistics, the width, you see um, 
you can describe it by Gaussian statistics is the projection of these, um, let's say, distributions here on, on this x-axis. And you can find as a function of those, it doesn't vary too much, and we always find about below 10 nanometers. Hold on, didn't I say before that basically the helium ion beam should be focused to, down to one nanometer, but we measure now nine? Actually, it's exactly what we expected. Um, so what is happening when you look at the um, trajectories of these ions and also the secondary electrons, they come up from, in this case, graphene silicon, but also for the other chips with the silicon, silicon oxide for the optic chips. So basically the secondary electrons, they come up from the bottom. In most cases, when you do nanofab in your PhD or postdoc and you use a PMMA as an um, E-beam resist, you always um, basically uh, all the exposure is done from the bottom. These are always the um, secondary electrons, actually. It's the same physics here, and it has been predicted by another Apinizia group and paper in here before. And they um, predicted that basically the resolution for the materials, what we have, should be nine nanometers. We are measuring, yeah, it's pretty close. So it's basically, this is now my slide in this room where I say, Richard, yes, we can get down there. I mean, we have seen several of these slides uh, where your work is always the best. I like them because it's the, the style of our, let's say, time spirit. Um, we project basically all these quantum emitters in a way who can position it best. That's our work. But of course, when you compare it to the NV seconds, quantum emitters and 2D materials suck. If you look, for example, strain, it's much easier. Uh, you have seen already before to implement tungsten selenide and waveguides and so forth. Um, with the strain, it's much easier because they always bend and you always have strain in there. But um, we compare in terms of that we're really in this regime where we have STM as demonstrated, but also transmission electron microscope um, results from graphene where we can go down to a single atom. And this is where our work is best. I'm very happy about that, actually. And this is basically where um, Richard was right in this case. Okay, let's have a look at the level structures. So this is now for the experts, and hopefully also I can motivate the biologists amongst um, us to say, wow, that's really super cool. Okay, um, all of you might have wondered, why didn't Alex tell us that this luminescence is asymmetric? Is that normal? No, it's not. Um, typically, if you have just a two-level system, it should be just a very beautiful Laurentian-shaped emission of the luminescence. In this case, it's always, or in most cases, asymmetric. What we use to describe that, this is an early uh, measurement here from 2019, measured at 10 Kelvin, and this is now basically just the emission of the luminescence. And what we have fitted it uh, here, it's a so-called independent boson model. The independent boson model, I don't write it down because I'm not as familiar with that with, uh, as Anya before, but it's basically one um, energy term, one Hamiltonian is for the excitons, the second one is for the phonons, and the third one is basically an uh, effective interaction Hamiltonian. And this effective um, interaction Hamiltonian gives you a, a length, which is the so-called so effective ball radius. And this is basically meaning at which length scale does the exciton interact with the phonon. And this is about two nanometers in this case, but now the newer measurements and data, they're cleaner for some reason, we find more and more three nanometers interaction lengths. And what we also know um, immediately, this is an emission of phonons. So it's an, let's say Stokes, and um, you will see it in the next slide. It looks really like a triangular. If you go to, um, to very low temperatures, you emit phonons. And when you do a temperature series, as it's done here, you even get out the numbers of phonons you emit. In this case, at 10 Kelvin, it's between two and three phonons at about an energy of four electron volt, which you emit. What does that mean? So you emit acoustic phonons. These are the ones with the linear dispersion at low um, K, at low momentum. And so four milliV is basically roughly here, 32 wave numbers, what you have here. And this is what we get out from these fits that you take basically the fit as a function of temperature. You get all these different Hamiltonians and collect all the parameters and then we know all that. Um, and now let's do spectroscopy. A good way to know about the wave function is to squeeze it. And what we do is the Laurentian force, and you squeeze, let's say, a spherical um, wave function to smaller and smaller and smaller, of course, the energy goes up. This diamagnetic shift can be recorded, 
This is a heroic measurement, Andreas Stier proposed that together with John, that we went to our friends in Grenoble. We did that um, and we went up to 28 Tesla. That is the most expensive experiment I have ever financed. <laughs> and also energy wise and CO2 wise, that's, I mean, I can use airplanes in a good um, conscious for this experiment in my, on my laptop. So what you see is basically you have this diamagnetic shift going up and this diamagnetic shift, um, Alex Hutka, um, did this evaluation here, goes up and you can fit this uh, diamagnetic shift and immediately you know that the wave function has a size of about 3.5 nanometers when you do the math, which is consistent with what we had before with this independent Bose model. And it's also consistent in particular with the fits what we have here. And now you see this is now at 4.2 Kelvin. Um, one slide before it was in 10 Kelvin. At 4 Kelvin, these emitters look like this. They're pretty sharp now. And so this is the line where the excitons interact directly with the photons. And these tails here, this is this um, phonon emission. You see, it looks like a, um, uh, like a triangle. And actually, this is the exciton phonon interaction. And you can um, know at 4.2 Kelvin, we have roughly that 30% emit directly to the, uh, to the photons. And the um, rest, 70%, have to interact with the um, phonons first. So this is the zero phonon line, which is very sharp. And by this fit here, we have exactly the same, let's say, diameter affected ball radius of this fit. What we also have, um, when you compare the two lines, there's a tiny shift. That was, we were really disappointed to see that because the ball magnetic moment is really small at first view. And then also what we had, the degree of circular polarization here, and it only showed up at about 15 Tesla in this sample. Um, and so basically to take the home mess, take home message here were these three measurements. And how can we explain it for this first um, emitter, what, which we baptized Q1. These are the ones at 1.75 EV. And then you need to talk to your theory friends. So this is a calculus by Amir Tomer from Weizmann in the group of Sivan and Raffaele Abramson. I'm very happy that they helped us to solve this riddle. So we have a hexagonal momentum space. Typically for MOS2, you have basically all these, um, let's say balance bands up down here and then up here, the um, conduction bands. You might wonder why is that three electron volts up here? Actually, um, the numbers here should be about 2.4 for two um, electron volts, because these are the single particle excitations in your system. That is, these are the energy scales what you measure with an STM. What I have shown you in the last slides, these are optical measurements. So the electron hole pairs, they see each other and the energy is renormalized by the exciton binding energy. And that is the 1.75 electron volts. If you look at it from a single particle picture, the defect has these bands here. First of all, the char, um, the um, conduction band, defect one, the conduction and defect two, it's a duplet. And then we have the balance band down here. If you project that as a function of energy here, you see this is the density of states. And you see this is the balance band band. It goes here, but then it hybridizes with the balance band of the crystal. And then you have the, here the duplet states at about um, single particle energy um, of about two EV. And which is, um, as you can see it here in the Prunel zone. And I hope you can project it a little bit in your mind. It's basically K and K um, dash are sitting here. And then we go from K dash to um, gamma into the center like this one here. And basically this is a very complicated plot because you also have it with the total magnetic moment. This is basically the average how much, um, how good can, can the wave function or this state can interact with a magnetic field. This is um, basically encoded in the number here. With this plot, we can explain the degree of circular polarization in a way that basically at a high magnetic field like 15 Tesla, um, the um, conduction band of the defect goes up at the K point and goes down at the K um, dash point. This is an effect because of the what you have in 2D materials. It's basically uh, more or less the Lorentz force and also um, imaged on top of the um, reciprocal space of this hexagonal um, lattice constant. And then um, what has happening is basically when your Fermi energy is very close to that, 
the um, transition at the K prime point digs into this Fermi C, and by that the emission here gets down, while the emission at the circular plus um, transition is still increased. And if you look um, by that, basically we can nicely describe what we see here that basically the sigma um, plus um, emission is increased in comparison to the sigma minus um, um, emission. What we, when we now would like to know about the um, Bohr uh, magneton of these transitions, we have to go now into the exciton picture, and this is um, shown here. So this is a beta cell beta calculation. So what is that? We excite basically electrons from at the valence band into the conduction band of the defect, and now they interact such that you have an exciton binding energy. And um, when I first saw the plots, I mean, the Apinitio, they get 40,000 different excitonic wave function possibilities in such a defect. Hooray. <laughs> so you talk to your theory friends and say, please help us. We don't understand what's going on. And then they come back. Well, one out of 40,000, it's the right uh, answer. And it was quite a traumatic discussion what we had then. But um, this is the final way to present the data and I was very happy that we had it. Then finally, so at the energy of about 1.75, you see that this is the, um, it's, it's a bright state. This is encoded now in color. So this is basically the relative absorption. There are many photons coming out here and they have a Bohr magneton. It's a mean exciton Zeeman splitting of about 0.1. This is exactly what we saw. Why is it bright? Because we have parallel, um, states at the gamma point going to the K point and also over there. If you have parallel states in the reciprocal states, there are many, many transitions. It's the so-called joint density of states. And by that, it's a bright state, which um, basically emits a lot of photons, but it has a very small Bohr magneton in here. And this is now the distribution, what we have here. So these are basically the oscillator strength, what we have coming out from the Hamiltonians. Um, at the gamma point, you see that you have the conduction band of the defect interacting with the balance band of the defect and also the second conduction band interacting here. This is an hybridized state. And then if you compare it at the K and the K prime point, um, you have a, let's say, minor distribution from the conduction band to the balance band of the crystal, which is different at um, an energy which is below that at about 1.68 roughly. And here you can see the distribution or the contribution from the gamma point is very small, while at the K point is very large. Did I lose you? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm very happy to discuss that in the lunch break. And for the ones who are the experts amongst us, I hope they already got it. So what is the take home message? We got now to the point that we have single atoms, which we can produce. We are quite uh, confident that this is really true now. We have three different emitters. The most prominent one at 1.75, we believe is the one is uh, the sulfur vacancy. Then what we have also is now we have a contribution at 1.67, which is basically the, con the defect to the balance band transition, which shows, I hope I have animated it correctly now. Yes, a more pronounced degree of circular polarization because this is an exciton where the wave functions hybridize with the balance band of the whole crystal. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an intermixture between the defect band, conduction band with the balance band of the whole crystal. And so you have much more valley degree of freedom in there. And the third peak, what I promised you, shows up here as well in this paper. It's under review right now. Actually, we have the reports. I think it looks very good, actually, I have to say. And so basically here we see the statistics, what I showed you before, that these are the emitters referenced with respect to the exciton of the unperturbed crystal. And so here, these are the first emitters. Then these are what the ones are showing up once you basically haven't encapsulated your sample first. And it turns out that the Q star, what we call, have a negligible diamagnetic shift. But that means the wave function is so tiny, tiny, tiny that even 28 Tesla doesn't help you to squeeze the wave function. And this is why we explain it in a way that you have an oxygen with an large electroaffinity sitting on top and then you pull out the wave function 
to outside of the crystal and by that what is um, basically left over for the exciton is really tiny and by that the diamagnetic shift the ability to be squeezed is very small and this is what we also detect in these magnetic uh, luminescence studies how am i doing with the time one more minute um i almost did it okay what are in the next um, directions i want to shortcut it in this way like this the next directions, there are many proposals out there to couple quantum emitters, but also quantum dots to um, different cavities. And we also saw it in the last talk. They're, they're similar, not similar, but um, in the same motive directed um, proposals out there. Two of them are presented up here. For instance, that you couple defects or quantum emitters in a cavity like this. And, in a, and if you have an optomechanical cavity, um, you can basically uh, transduce um, the transition, what we saw from 1.75 electron volts, which is about 700 nanometers, down to the microwave. And so that you have one quantum mechanical system where the wave function or the physical properties are quantum mechanical uh, um, in the whole setup. These are the proposals. These are the next directions. And I can tell you from my review activities, there are proposals also from experimental groups realizing that. Okay, um, I would like to thank my group, but first of all, also John Finney's group. John is involved in all that. I'm very happy about that. It's a great pleasure, John, to collaborate on that. Um, and also, I would like to thank Kai Müller. Christoph um, is also involved, and he was responsible for this temperature series and the STM studies. Andreas um, was the leading PI on the magnetic luminescence studies. These are the involved PhD students. Um, I would like to mention that Nina is uh, showing a poster on him generated defects in tungsten sulfide on Thursday. I'm happy on that. I would also would like to thank all the postdocs and uh, professors worldwide collaborating with us on this topic. It's a great crowd. I have to say I would like to thank, as a matter of course, also all the funding agencies. And I think it's also opportune to show this. We have open PhD positions if you're fascinated by defects which are somehow maybe possibly we don't know good for quantum cryptography in future and um, I mean what we have shown it's side, a side selective definition of atomistic quantum emitters in MAMAS 2 and they can be integrated into nanophotonics plasmonic optoelectronics and also in future optomechanical devices thank you very much space optics can you give us a hint how, how these defects perform or what are the kind of challenges compared to, to other emitters so macroscopically they are pretty much the same i mean but of course um, you can nicely integrate it into for example waveguides as, a, as has been already demonstrated um, in particular you're using basically the um, advantage of the lateral positioning it's a maskless patterning with the helium ion um, lithography that you can say, okay, this is a working device. I would like to have an emitter there. To be honest, um, John and I have been trying that um, already a couple of months. It's not so straightforward because the fabrication, it's difficult. I mean, to, but this is standard. I mean, it's solvable. Um, actually, we have uh, confocal plane imaging data of these ones. And it's, um, it's basically everything optically, electrodynamically, it's um, dominated by the chip full stop. So it's basically where the dielectric constant is, um, there goes the light. Okay. Yeah. Microscopically, um, if you compare our results to what Richard demonstrated yesterday, I mean, um, we have now data at 100 millikelvin that's together with Walt Zwiller, um, where we get down the phonon numbers to an average below one. That's satisfying, it's going there. Um, what you have seen now, I would say, if we project it to the results of Richard, it's the noise. I mean, um, what you have seen there, the statistics, I mean, they're getting better and better. What I like here, I mean, also the dirtiest samples, we have at least 100 emitters positioned and we can look at them. I mean, Richard, how many quantum dots you have running for several years and, and take always the best one? 
Okay. <laughs> okay. And so this is basically the statistics. That's a great advantage. But we're not there. There are great proposals out there to look at the nuclear spin dynamics. I mean, uh, Meta has addressed that a little bit. Um, and this will be addressed in the next coming years. I mean, it's interesting that you have this hexagonal symmetry. There are some predictions that this is advantageous. Um, Gallo has uh, proposed that a couple of years ago, that the uh, nuclear spin relaxation should be pretty low once you have this uh, spin addressed. Um, what we show in this archive paper, it will be accepted soon, I think, um, is that with the gate, um, you can access now the spin. Um, that's a next step, I would say, um, that basically you break the symmetry of this hexagonal uh, duplet structure in this case by bringing in the Fermi energy close and then with the with the Fermi energy in combination with the magnetic semen splitting um, you can access one of the levels which are of interest that's the idea so that's where we are and then of course we will follow all the beautiful work of the quantum dots of the Inga's quantum dots but please um, biologists never forget the first quantum dots were published in 1986 okay from 1986 to these beautiful results in quantum optics it only took three um, generations of PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, I have two questions, actually. If you excite this defect, you know the probability that it creates a photon and not, not decays by some other process. Okay. And my, my other question is, um, have you tried resonant excitation? It could be relatively simple because you could detect I mean, there was, the photons in the... In I would the like to answer the, the second first. I mean, um, John proposed that from the beginning, let's do PLE on that. And we have data on that. Um, when you look at this calculus now, um, with the Peter Sal Peter um, calculus, which it shows that you have a very hybridized state of the defects hybridized with all the conduction band electron states. And this is consistent with the PLE data, what we have that basically, or what we do experimentally, we always go at the tail at the low energy tail of the exciton to excite everything. And so by that, we, we have the whole story. It's not, I mean, your, your question I interpreted, how far are the excitations in with respect to a two level system? We're not there yet. I would love to do this heroic experiment by Alex Hook. Um, in 2004 on these uh, dots, and then that would be the next step, let's say. Alex. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, it is uh, indeed a very nice uh, and deterministic technique. So do you see this duplet structure in, as you mentioned now, PLE type of experiments, and what is the, the energy scale? I couldn't grab it from... from um, uh, so from Apinizio, it's about 4 milli EV. And um, what I did not show you, I don't want to go to slides, which I didn't show. I don't like this style of presentation. So basically what we have, Alex Hötke has, it's a nano letter. It's published in 2021. And uh, basically with the gate, you can um, switch them off. And um, we show, I think, 13 different um, uh, quantum emitters in this respect by the switching off behavior. And you see that they, some of them split. It's interesting, but um, we haven't had the possibility to look at them with a, a circular polarization and do the statistics. Um, the samples have to be clean, but this is the general theme of every speaker here. And once you get rid of oxygen and everything, you need to do the statistics on the pure defects being switched off. Follow-up, what are the prospects of uh, multi exciton emission? Did you see any bi emission? No, we don't see that. And I also uh, would say, going back to this um, switching off experiment by Alex Hotka, um, it's basically when you look at the data with this respect, they're always blue shifting when you switch them off, which for me reads like that they're non-charged. It's also this argument what we had here with the Sivan, it's a hybridized state, and then basically we have the oscillator strength of one of them dominating because you have a joint density of states. But in our understanding, they're not charged when we switch them off. And then the um, trion, let's say, called trion, comes up from the exciton. Last question. You reported a lateral resolution of nine nanometers. Could that maybe be improved by uh, using the helium ion microscope on freestanding? Of course. Um, 
if you have any master student who wants to do that, the problem is the following. I mean, um, it can be re, um, increased, uh, but the um, cross section goes down. The probability to have one defect goes up. And now it's quite interesting. I mean, you're very good in these maths, uh, Martin. It's an, a formation energy of 0.7 EV, what we estimate. Is it stable at room temperature or not if you have a freely su suspended MOS2 with one defect in there? It's jumping around. Okay, so thanks, Alex, a lot. Thank you.